Welcome again from a far distance. Today we are to going to talk about the tooth and the development of the tooth, the general structure of it and how it develops. Everyone has recognized that this one is far from the human, just to show the variability of the tooth during phylogenesis. This is human now. This one is a dried out tooth and each of them has got, in general, has got one crown on top. This is the thing what we freely can see. Uh, which is joined to the root through the neck of it. It's a narrow, small portion of the root. Uh, the root has got the, the canals inside, and these canals lead into the pulp chamber cavity uh, through an opening at the apex of the root that is called the apical foramen. And this is the place where all the blood vessels, nerves can get into the pulp chamber, which is full of mesenchymal connective tissue and needed to, supply, to be supplied. There are some general rules related to the number of roots. In general, uh, posteriorly as you go, the number increases. Uh, this is because bigger mechanical forces act posteriorly. Everyone knows from practical life that a scissor using at the tip of the scissor is not a powerful um, cutting tool, but as you go closer and closer to the axis of the scissor, more and more uh, force can be reached from, the, from it. And the other general rule related to each other, the corresponding teeth, always in the upper row has got one more root. And this is because the mandible has got an extremely compact structure. Uh, someone can kill people with using a mandible of a goat or something like that, but the maxilla is made up of spongy bone, so more fixing, more, more encourage, uh, anchoring uh, is needed to keep in position the upper root. General description of the, of the uh, structures of, of the root. In, in general, two components we should distinguish, the hard tissues and the soft tissues, hard components and soft components. The uh, main uh, component of the heart is hydroxyapatite uh, crystal. Uh, into this crystal many, many well-known ions are uh, embedded. Everyone knows them from uh, advertisements in the television of toothpaste. Uh, every th all the three uh, different components it has got the same hydroxyapatite with, mixed with uh, several other uh, materials and therefore the, uh, the hardness of the uh, other components varies uh, from place to place. But uh, here is the hardest tissue found in the body on the crown and this is the enamel covering it. A uh, much nicer name was previously used, Substantia adamantino. Uh, Adamas, I wonder if you know, uh, means diamond. So it, it, it refers to the extreme hardness, toughness of the, of the substance here. Uh, then uh, all along the tooth, so all the parts contain a deeper tissue called the dentin, which was previously called substantia eburneo. Eburo is the ivory, again uh, referring to the toughness of the tissue that the early name was used. And finally, just on the root outside the uh, dentin, there's a thin layer of cementum. This one is the third component. When you get the slice of the tooth on the exam, uh, the first question to be asked uh, from yourself first, uh, which part of the tooth the slide is from? Uh, if you see enamel plus dentin all to uh, together and nothing else, then it means that the, the uh, slice was made from the crown. If you see the dentin and cementum on top of each other, then the root is cut through. Then the soft components of the tooth in the pulp chamber, as was already mentioned, mesenchymal connective tissue is found with uh, many, many blood vessels, nerves and everything. Everyone knows about the toothache, so nerves uh, are responsible for that. And this mesenchyme is of ectodermal origin, later it comes again, uh, and therefore we call it ectomesenchyme. And uh, there is a living cell layer lining the pulp chamber cavity, and this is the odontoblast layer. So this one is to be kept alive, therefore the blood supply of the inner part of the tooth is essential. First starting with the dentin, even if it is deep to the enamel, deep to the cementum, but because it extends all along the tooth, therefore we start with the dentin. 
Um, this is a beautiful drawing, beautiful illustration of Professor Kirstich, uh, which, uh, which shows at uh, very many aspects, uh, many, many cuts of the dentin. Uh, someone can recognize the uh, inner layer which uh, faces the pulp chamber cavity, so from that part of uh, the tooth was taken. Uh, and this is the odontoblast layer. Then the, the thick layer of the dentin itself is seen, covered either by enamelum, if the crown is showed, or by cementum, if the root is showed. All along uh, this, uh, there are several, several radier, tiny mini channels passing through from the odontoblast layer till the enamel or the cementum. There are some important junctions of diff uh, tissues of different hardness, different toughness. Uh, dentino enamel junction is found on the crown, and the dentino cemental or the cemento dentinal border on the neck. Uh, dentinal tubules are the uh, ones which contain radier processes of the odontoblast cells extending till the uh, bottom of the enamel or bottom of the cementum. These are called the Tom's fibers, so living cell processes. These are, if from the inner part the drawing is taken, then you can see this single layer of uh, epithelloid. These uh, cells completely resemble to simple columnar epithelium, considering the shape of the nuclei perpendicular to the base of the cell. Mm -hmm. But uh, contrary to the epithelium, you can see blood vessels going in between the cells, and the blood vessels are accompanied by tiny mini uh, sensory fibers. Therefore, the dentin itself is well innervated. Anything reaching the dentin can cause a pain, toothache, aching tooth. Uh, but the enamel is not uh, uh, innervated at all. Therefore, it is uh, senseless. Uh, the components of the substance in which, in, in which the Tom's fibers are found uh, uh, as for all the connective tissue intercellular uh, matrix, fibers should be, these are collagen fibers, and the ground substance, which is the usual, has the usual components as in other tissues. 20% uh, uh, of all the components is organic, the rest is inorganic, so calcification uh, is deposited uh, onto the collagen fibers. Uh, there is a layer which differs in staining, in color, in, in sh shade from the rest of the dentin, and this is called the pre-dentin, the freshly synthesized, since all the dentin is produced by the odontoblast cells, therefore close to the odontoblast, the youngest dentin is found, and this one is the pre-dentin. The only difference from the uh, major dentin is that it, it has no uh, calcium deposition inside. Uh, this one is a ground tooth. Uh, it means that, uh, like for the bone you looked at before, there is no uh, previously living substance, no, no organic component at all. So this is a de dead tooth. And the enamel dentin junction, dentino enamel junction, is picked up. Uh, the enamel has got uh, prisms inside, as later to be discussed. And you can recognize the dentin uh, by uh, looking at uh, the dentinal tubules previously containing the odontoblast processes, but now, of course, they must be empty. The important thing is that between the two substances, necessarily, for a while at least, there is a basal lamina. Uh, the reason for that uh, you are going to see later. Between epithelium and connective tissue, basal lamina should necessarily be present. Yeah, with higher magnification, these dentinal tubules are shown in longitudinal and in cross section, and once again containing nothing now. But if you make a slice uh, of decalcified tooth, so this is a real histological slide with hematoxinosis staining, uh, then you can see these radial channels still containing the processes of odontoblast uh, uh, cells. You can clearly see the difference in staining between the dentin, the major dentin, and the pre-dentin, which has no calcification at all. But within the dentin itself, the staining is unequal. Uh, there are places which appear paler 
and these are called intergubular spaces. Uh, it, it just means that less uh, calcification happened here. Uh, the, the Tom's fibers, if with higher magnification, these are uh, photographed. You can see them running parallel with each other, but peripherally, these fibers uh, uh, branch gradually once or twice. They branch before they reach the basal uh, lamina uh, next to, for example, here the acellular cementum. Uh, the fibers you should be uh, careful with the term fibers, of course. So many, many fiber types you've learned before. Uh, skeletal muscle fiber, connective tissue fibers, nerve fiber, um, and I don't know what. This is a new type of fiber which has nothing to do with the others. This is just a peripheral process of a cell. Uh, Decalcified, uh, 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 dried out tooth, you can see uh, the dentin again. But the dentin now is covered by enamel, as well as because the dentin has got a unique shape here, one can expect to have a molar or premolar uh, tooth, which has got more than one tubercles on top, so double cusp or the triple cusp it has got. Uh, in this case, these intergubular spaces, the less calcified spaces, appear as dark air-containing uh, uh, spots, uh, as well as the uh, radial dentinal tubules are seen. Uh, sometimes these integral spaces are uh, so densely packed that they form a continuous layer. This uh, quite uh, uh, frequently happens next to acellular cement. And in this case, uh, this layer is called uh, the Tom's granular layer or granular layer of Tom's. Uh, now the cementum comes after that. The enamel is the last, the cementum, because it has quite a simple structure. Uh, first, the cementum should be continuous with enamel, since from the root it extends or continues up and replaced by the enamel. And this cemento-enamel junction has got variations in appearance. In most of individuals, 60-70% of individuals, uh, the cementum slightly overlaps uh, the enamel, and this is the very lucky situation because nowhere the dentin remains uncovered, so remains free. Uh, in the next uh, uh, population, 30% of population, uh, there is just a capillary gap in between the cementum and the enamel. Uh, this is fairly uh, uh, good still, but if there is a, a bigger uh, distance, between the two substances, then the uh, dentin remains free and therefore uh, inflammation on anything can freely penetrate into the dentin. This one, thanks God, is quite rare. Five to ten percent of population or of the, of the teeth have got uh, this kind of arrangement. The cementum appears in two different uh, uh, types. One is the acellular cement. It means that just ground substance, uh, nothing else, calcified ground substance makes it up. And uh, this one is found at this junction, what we just described, acellular cement, and everywhere immediately next to the dentin. The cellular cement is uh, next to alveolar bones, so on the outer aspect of the root you can find this. And as you have a closer look to, this one is ground uh, cementum, uh, these hairy small animals resemble very well to osteocytes. And these are really corresponding to a variant of osteocytes. Uh, the only difference is that they remain spherical because in the uh, cementum there are no special lamellae which would compress these cells. But otherwise, these are also hairy cells, many, many processes, branching processes uh, 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 in, other, in other directions. And sometimes, of course, they are connected with each other with gap junctions. Therefore, the diffusion of nutrients is uh, made through these processes. So the nutrition is made through these processes of the cellular cementum. Now the enamel comes, again, the toughest tissue of, of, uh, uh, of, of the body. Here, uh, a piece of the junction between the crown and the root, you can see. And if this one is enlarged, as Professor Kirstich has done it, and made this beautiful drawing against several aspects, several cuts simultaneously illustrated in the same picture. Uh, this is the border, what uh, you can recognize here, from where 
almost all the enamel has been removed just to make uh, visible the surface of the dentin underneath the enamel. On this surface there are some impressions and into these impressions the units of the enamel fit. These units are the enamel prisms made up of hydroxyapatite crystals almost completely. Uh, clearly these crystals densely packed to each other. Uh, uh, just before we continue, uh, have a look at uh, the broken surface of the dentin itself, in which you can recognize the odontoblast processes within the, the atoms fibers within uh, the uh, dentinal tubules. But the calcification again makes some uh, unique arrangements of the uh, ground substance, uh, some uh, more calcified, so toughest sheaths surround some of these processes, and these are called the Neumann sheaths. And the other uh, thing is that, interestingly enough, as uh, the, uh, this drawing also shows, some of these Tom's fibers exceed the border between enamel and dentin and further uh, project into the enamel. Uh, for that one, uh, I have no reason what, what the use or what the importance should be. The fine structure of the enamel is to be discussed. Here you can see high uh, resolution uh, uh, illustration of, of the unit of the enamel, which is a very nicely shaped, unique shaped prism, a longitudinal long, long prism. Uh, with this shape, someone can completely close a surface. This one is uh, something resembling to an old-fashioned keyhole or something like that. But putting them together, no space uh, remains free. Here you can see uh, these prisms packed together. Uh, the unit of the prism, as we said before, the hydroxyapatite crystal, densely packed within the prisms. So in uh, this drawing, you can see the prism cut at two different aspects. One is longitudinal cut, and here you can see the cross section of it, as well as you can see the third dimension extending farther away from, from the screen. This is, was taken from that part of the enamel, so this one is the free surface of the enamel. What you can recognize, I, I hope at least you can clearly see, because I do, there are some prisms which bend, in this case, in the plane of the screen. So here you can see one bending, not leaving the screen, another bending, another bending, another bending. Number one, number three behaves the same. But number two, I hope you see, first it runs within the plane of the screen, then it jumps out of it and continues again parallel with the screen. Again another jumping is found here, and again uh, parallel with the screen it goes. Now this uh, beautiful wavy arrangement of the uh, enamel prisms ensure that all the prisms uh, should bear the same uh, power and they are not allowed to shift related to each other. Uh, the theory behind this that uh, there is a, a, a periodic growth of the enamel uh, prisms. Uh, first, the borders between the prisms are seen as uh, lines uh, being perpendicular to the surface of the crown or to the dentino enamel junction. Uh, and uh, this is made by the groups of enamel prisms. And this other line, the ratius lines, lines of ratius, uh, represent uh, this uh, periodic growth of the prisms. Some one, eight days, the prism elongates and then it rests a bit. Then makes a turn and continues growing in, a, in, in another plane, uh, further, further uh, towards the surface. And due to these lines, which are aligned with each other, uh, someone can see in our slide, for example, and this is one of the uh, signs after which you can recognize that not cementum, but enamelum your slide contains, that there is a clear uh, striping, lining, lines are oriented uh, 45 degrees to the surface or to the dentino animal junction. And these are called the lines of ratios. So if you see these lines of ratios here, uh, they are illustrated on the drawing, then the enamel is to be looked at. Now after this, uh, we should deal with the development of the tooth. Uh, I think it's too early because you have not heard about the uh, development of the face yet. But in the first semester, you've learned that uh, 
the pre-coder plate when it makes the one, uh, 20, uh, 270 degrees turn and gets to the depth of the face, gets impressed, then the stomodome is pulled into the face uh, by this moving pre plate, now called the bucopharyngeal membrane. And the stomodome is seen on this slide, cut through. Uh, someone can uh, recognize from the button of the stomodome, stomodome is a primitive oral cavity, from the button something growing up, and that is the future uh, tongue here. So in this frontal cut, one can see the upper and the lower jaw, and in uh, both of them you can see thickening of epithelium. This epithelium, since it is epithelium of the stomodome, uh, uh, belongs to the ectoderm, of course, so these are ectodermal thickenings. Of course, if uh, on both sides you can see them, uh, they should be connected with each other, so something like a horseshoe-like uh, upper and lower curved thickening happens in the stomodo, uh, corresponding to the future rows of upper and lower teeth. In a small uh, portion of, uh, of the stomodo, one can recognize the upper lip, the lower lip, this is the angle of the mouth, so it is taken from the right half of the oral cavity. This is the developing tooth. And there is something here which is a cartilage. Later you are going to learn that this one is a cartilage, the first pharyngeal arch. Just a cartilage and that's it now. What you can see here that this thickening deepens. Of course the lower uh, part of the stomodon is seen here. The same is happening uh, on the maxillary portion. And this one is called the thickened epithelium, uh, labiodental lamina. I think it's easy because the lip, the labium, is separated from the future tooth by this lamina. Uh, since uh, this is a thickened epithelial growth into the mesenchyme surrounding it, therefore the central uh, cells have got the less, less nutrition from the mesenchyme, therefore they soon will die and disappear, and therefore this groove uh, deepens and deepens. From this labiodental lamina, another group of cells grow towards the, in this case, tongue or towards the palate in the, uh, up in the case of the upper row. And these are the future uh, teeth. So these are prim primordial of the, of the tooth. This is called the dental lamina. Uh, the dental lamina soon breaks up into uh, separate small uh, spherical groups of cells and these are called the dental buds. So this is the first appearance of separate uh, primordial of the teeth. Meanwhile, uh, this labiodental sulcus was uh, deepening and uh, the lamina from where the dental lamina gets separated is now called the vestibular lamina since with labiodental sulcus the oral vestibule is going to be formed a deepening of the uh, sulcus forms the oral vestibule. Now, the different developmental stages are to be discussed, either in a real histological slide or in a schematic drawing. Uh, that is the first stage, which is called the bud stage. In, in, in this case, the epithelium resembles to a spherical group of cells, uh, which is surrounded by mesenchyme, but mesenchyme of neural crest origin, and therefore it is ectomesenchyme. As you are going to see later, uh, all the components of the teeth, therefore, are of ectodermal origin. So surrounded by uh, condensed, more or less condensed mesenchyme, uh, this uh, proliferation of the mesenchyme finally presses uh, one uh, wall of the bowl-like spherical uh, enamel organ, and the organ gradually becomes double wood, and therefore someone can distinguish outer and inner cells and the mass in between them. Uh, the outer is called the outer enamel epithelium, and inside this uh, uh, cap-like uh, uh, primordium, you can see a tissue which fairly resembles to mesenchyme, but because is, is of ectodermal origin, so from epithelium it remains. Therefore, it is not mesenchyme, it is a specific type of epithelium called the stellate reticulum or reticulo epithelium. So cells resembling to connective tissue cells, uh, but they are 
intercontinental, they are kept together by the junctions and the only uh, fluid accumulates in between, no uh, intercellular, other intercellular matrix or component is to be found here. The condensed mesenchyme uh, later develops into, presses, in, presses inward into this bowl and uh, later becomes the dental papilla. It is called dental papilla. Uh, at the uh, 16th week, something on the, uh, again, inside, it means that towards the tongue or towards the palate, in a respect of the dental uh, cap, uh, appears the, uh, the primordium of the permanent tooth. So in, in the slides, uh, quite frequently, what you get on the exam, you can see this uh, beautifully developing tooth, but next to it, another thing is started to be developed, and this is the permanent tooth, the primordium of the permanent tooth. So as the mesenchyme gets, con uh, the uh, dental papilla gets condensed and grows and grows in volume, it presses one wall, this is ab oral, so ab away from the oral cavity, ab oral wall of the enamel organ. And in this case, you can distinguish three different remnants of uh, the um, cup stage. Uh, outer enamel epithelium, inner enamel epithelium, which one is pressed by the mesenchyme, and in between them is this stellate reticulum or reticular epithelium. Otherwise, everything is epithelium. All the components are belonging to epithelium. The dental papilla, where with the mesenchymes, uh, grow and grow, and uh, when it is uh, attached to the either enamel cells, then uh, there is a transformation of the mesenchyme. Mesenchymal cells get closer and closer to each other. They become elongated, and finally, at the tip of the future tooth first, uh, they turn into odontoblast and start to produce uh, some material, uh, which is a dentin, of course. Uh, the mesenchyme, which is not so condensed as the dental papilla, but still somewhat denser, a densely arranged mesenchyme surrounds all the developing tooth, and this one is called the dental follicle. And outside of it, you can see the future permanent, uh, the, the primordium of the future permanent tooth. Here you can see it with higher magnification. Uh, the early bell stage uh, is still uh, the uh, Secretion of material starts here, outer and outer. So everything is the same as on the previous picture, but with higher magnification if you uh, look at stellate reticulum. Uh, this one is really exactly like the uh, embryonic connective tissue, like the mesenchyme, but don't forget it's epithelium. There is only one other place in the body where this epithelium is found. I think yet you have not heard about the lymphatic organs, but the thymus has got framework uh, as, as, as seen here, so stellate reticulum is the micro framework of the thymus, the, the or lymphatic, one of the lymphatic organs. So the product of the odontoblast is deposited on uh, the outer surface of these cells, and that is the dentin, and that makes the early bell stage, so I just wanted to f uh, and uh, figure out how to distinguish on the exam from early and late bell stage, because here you can see with the same piece, from the same piece with the same magnification, the late bell stage. In this case, the inner enamel epithelium also became a columnar, and it started, the epithelium started to produce something towards the dentin, and that is the product of these cells. The inner enamel epithelium is now called, should be called, amelo, uh, uh, adamantoblast layer, and the adamantoblast layer is the one which produces enamel. The odontoblast layer, as previously we saw, produces first the predentin, then the dentin, so this border is clearly visible between the two substances of, uh, of the dentin. Uh, to development of the uh, uh, lead uh, Professor Flerko, it was quite nice. First, the basement lamina is needed between the odontoblast cells, because these are connective tissue cells, so these are cells of mesenchymal origin, and these are the adamantoblast cells, which belong to epithelium, so between them, basement lamina is needed. In all the cases, outside the cell, the secretory granules are uh, released, 
and uh, the secretum is deposited, crystals are to be formed here, and uh, the uh, uh, dentin is uh, to be uh, produced by the odontoblast, and by this process, all the productive cells are getting farther and farther from the basement lamina. Uh, the difference in uh, their behavior is that the processes of odontoblast cells are soon uh, uh, really uh, letting the basement lamina. They do not uh, keep contact with the basement lamina. The reason for that is that uh, uh, the fate of them is determined. At uh, the time of eruption of the tooth, all these cells should, should die. But the odontoblasts are still living in your tooth as well. Therefore, they are to be kept in uh, contact with the basement lamina, as then would you explanation. You. Uh, there's an uh, intensive interaction between the uh, components of the developing tooth. Partly the epithelium acts on the mesenchyme, mesenchyme acts back to epithelium, and due to these interactions, epithelial mesenchymal interactions, finally the tooth is developed. First the uh, ectoderm of stomodeum uh, thickens, uh, as dental lamina, and this is due to the condensation of the mesenchyme uh, deep to this. Uh, the uh, the uh, dental lamina, in turn, induces the mesenchyme to further condense, and therefore uh, this condensed mesenchyme produces the dental papilla, and the dental papilla again influences the dental uh, lamina to form uh, the enamel organ, and the enamel epithelium uh, acts back to the odontoblast cells, to, to these uh, mesenchymal cells of the papilla, which uh, differentiate into uh, pro-odontoblasts and uh, finally into odontoblasts. And odontoblasts uh, initiate uh, the secretion of, uh, for first the formation of the ameloblast and then the secretion of the enamel. Here the dentin and predentin is formed. Uh, here are the different factors uh, uh, cleared up till now, uh, participating in this interaction. Uh, ectoderm of stomodeum produces these factors, which act onto the ectomesenchyme, which, um, uh, through other factors and other genes, act back to the uh, to the ectoderm and form the dental lamina. Dental lamina cells again almost the same factors using, act back and uh, the condensed mesenchyme of the dental papilla is formed, which initiates the formation of enamel bud, which in turn the dental papilla formation uh, initiates, and the dental papilla, uh, the inner enamel epithelium, it forces to become the, uh, the uh, ameloblast cell layer. Adamantoblast and odontoblast finally formed. Here is a fine illustration of all the process of these cell movements. This one is uh, the reflection of outer enamel epithelium into the inner enamel epithelium, so the adamantoblast cell layer. And this one is a small portion of the uh, uh, stellate reticulum of the enamel pulp. Perhaps uh, these, uh, this is the thing which uh, contains the reserve cells, and these reserve cells with strong notch one expression, expression uh, they uh, initiate the formation of the uh, of the uh, uh, progeny mig migrating cells, and the transit amplifying cells are the ones which are produced here due to LFNG. Uh, ameloblasts then. Uh, start to be produced by moving these cells towards the future uh, apex of the tooth. Uh, here are the factors taking part in this uh, process. Here the, all the process is here. The stem cells, they are from the stellate reticulum uh, getting, migrating into the enamel epithelium when they start to uh, to, to, to migrate very fast to the final position when they turn into ameloblast cells. Uh, all these things, what we talked about till now, is about the, uh, the, the crown, development of the crown only, but the root is equally important uh, to be produced. And uh, you can see this uh, schematic illustration, the same details as before, a single layer of odontoblast cells 
then the inner enamel epithelium later becoming uh, amyloblast uh, cells and then uh, the outer enamel epithelium with the cell later reticulum. And this reflection, which should uh, be circular of course, and only one half is seen here, but like a circle should be imagined, and this reflection, proliferation of cells, uh, start to grow deep into the mesenchyme. Now we are talking about the lower tooth, but the same happens opposite side. And this uh, growth makes a, a uh, cylindrical double uh, celled mass, uh, which was described by Hertwig, and therefore we call it the Hertwig's epithelial root sheath. And these cells again make induction of uh, the mesenchymal cells inside, uh, partly uh, the mesenchymes of the dental papilla. Uh, start to, to differentiate into odontoblast layers deeper than the uh, epithelial root sheath and more superficial layer uh, contains the cementoblasts and the cementoblasts make the acellular cementum. Uh, when the, these cells uh, are dying, so of course they should break up because there is no further good supply, at least for the inner cell layer, no, no good diffusion for, the, for them. Uh, then uh, breaks up and the dental the follicle uh, is turned into the cementoblast and these are the cellular uh, cements outside the, the Hertwig's root sheath. In case of uh, multiple roots of the tooth, this cylindrical uh, deep growth of the Hertwig's uh, root finally, by invagination, gets separated either uh, into two such cylinders in case of the uh, double rooted tooth or three uh, cylinders when three roots are going to be formed. The periodontium is the last to be discussed, so this is the connective tissue system which extremely firmly keeps the teeth in position. Uh, this was the specific type of uh, syndesmosis uh, in the first semester, if you remember, that was called the gonfosis. These many, many tiny, mini, but altogether extremely strong uh, collagen fibers uh, ensure uh, the position of the tooth. Uh, they uh, inter in interdental, uh, interdental gingival collar, they are surrounding the neck of the root. So according to that, that there are many, many arrangements of these collagen fibers, not needed for uh, general medicine students, of course. But what you should keep in mind that this one is where there is no epithelium on top of the connective tissue, practically. The two, two teeth are uh, reaching each other. This one is again a possible uh, pace, pl space for uh, getting bacteria deep into the connective tissue spaces. So the uh, arrangement of these uh, into different directions are depicted here, but only for dentistry students. This should be needed in the future, not for, for general medicine students. Uh, this one is a real histological picture. Uh, from the same space next to the cementum. This one is the root of the tooth, th therefore. All these fibers together are called the sharp, sharpest fibers, doesn't matter what orientation they've got. So once more, they are very uh, tiny mini, but altogether extremely strong. Now here comes the uh, importance of this Hertwig's epithelial root sheath. So in case uh, if remnants of uh, these epithelial cells uh, are found in adulthood, then uh, these could turn into cysts. And these are called the epithelial rests of uh, Malassi, but these are rests of Hertwig's root sheath. So in general, I think that's it. And uh, thanks for uh, your attention.